manumitted persons had to remove from the colony or state. Now, there's little indication of the enforcement at this time, however. The mid 18th century backcountry beckoned to people of African ancestry as it did to those of European origins who were fleeing indentured servitude. The area was especially appealing for people from Eastern North Carolina who found it wise to leave the area where they or their parents had been manumitted after 1741. In other words, they didn't have to follow the law to get out of the colony. They could just get out of the way of the area where they had been legally freed or where their parents had been legally freed. And one cannot ignore the possibility of groups of people fleeing enslavement and going to, into the backcountry together during the early years of the backcountry settlement, just like they went into swampy places in um, Eastern North Carolina. You can live somewhere beside a swamp if you go far enough into the backcountry. The interior, in fact, had a reputation for welcoming runaways because their labor was needed. Well, hire them as, as free laborers. And to establish homes near Native Americans who are not involved in major trade with white traders, increased the newcomer security by effectively hiding them. And of course, there were any number of uh, more or less secluded <clears throat> Native American communities. And by I mean secluded, I mean people who kept to themselves and were not involved all that much with white trade or white interaction. These were obvious places and, and we know that some African-American people did join those communities. Now, as an individual, <coughs> free man of African ancestry, I'm gonna give you just one example. Um, and that's George Jordan. He had lived in what became Orange County when it was created in 1752. He, he had lived here for a while. He shows up in earlier records where this area was part of Granville County, Edgecombe, and even going back to before the creation of Edgecombe when this area was part of Bertie County. And those records, and they're good number of land records for George Jordan. And they're all in pretty much the same area. And that's in present day Alamance County near a creek that eventually came to bear his name, Jordan Creek, of course. The records refer to George Jordan as black and also as free mulatto. And again, that's in records going back all the way to Bertie County before even Edgecombe and then Granville and then Orange were created. Now, when you get to the creation of Orange County in 1752, um, Orange County's original courthouse was in present day Alamance County. It was near today's uh, Quaker Lake. Um, the trading path crossed a network of streams that feed the Haw River nearby. So here uh, we're, we're getting into our waterways theme here. This is because the location of, the, of this first courthouse was because there was an important uh, fording place in what's now the town of, of Haw River. Now, this courthouse was not in use, but for about two years because once the western part of Orange County was um, lopped off to make Rowan County, which then included what's now Guilford, uh, then this courthouse was no longer in a central location within Orange County. And after that, of course, the courthouse for Orange County has been um, near the, the Eno River in, uh, in Hillsborough. But during the two years, when that courthouse near the Haw River was in use, um, there's a story of uh, kidnap and rescue that unfolded concerning that courthouse. And what this court case illustrates 
is that in the 1750s, race was not the strong factor in determining one's placement in society that it would become by the early 1800s. A grandfather named John Scott described himself as a freeborn Negro living near the, uh, the Congaree River in South Carolina, Piedmont in 1753, when he lodged a complaint in a South Carolina court. John Scott said that three men had broken into the house of his daughter, Amy Hawley, and had carried her away along with her six children, all born free. Scott thought the kidnappers intended to sell them as slaves in North Carolina. And in fact, two of the three men the grandfather named were residents of Orange County. Scott went to court and he got an order from what was called a hue and cry. And this order was to be circulated in the back country of both Carolinas. It was supposed to go from one county court to another. And it would have to be read out in any county court. Uh, and then if someone gave evidence that one or more of the kidnapped persons was present in that county, the court would have to assist in their release and return. That's what the court order was of the hue and cry. The hue and cry circulated through several North Carolina counties before William Chavis went to a Granville County Justice of the Peace and then presented evidence in the Orange County Court. Now, you'll recognize that name Chavis or Chavis as being a very common name for, for people in a variety of ethnic groups. There are a lot of African-American people with that name. There are white people with that name. There are people who claim mixed ancestry uh, with that name. This is a very prolific family. And as, as far as um, Mr. Heinig, who has studied um, free uh, Blacks in North Carolina and Virginia, and who's now deceased, as, as far as he could tell, um, William Chavis is the first one of that family to really be making a name and be in the records. And what Mr. Heine learned about William Chavis is that he was born around 1706 into an African-American family who already owned land and, and were free. They owned land in Eastern North Carolina. His father gave him some land and his father was born free. Um, near the Roanoke River. And this land near the Roanoke River launched William Chavis's move westward into Granville County in his early 20s. Chavis established himself by the 1740s as the owner of about 2,000 acres and the operator of at least one ordinary. He traded in land in Orange and Granville counties, typically getting land surveyed, making improvements on it to increase its value than trading it or selling it and, and getting new land. He owned enslaved workers um, who of course were the ones who made those improvements like building fences and clearing land uh, and so forth. Now, there was an African-American family named Holly, the name of Amy Holly of South Carolina that lived in Granville County, and they may have told Chavis of the South Carolina Holly family's plight. Uh, owners of ordinaries such as Chavis kept abreast of public affairs and facilitated contact with courts and with lawyers. By some means, an African-American boy known as Busby came into the protective custody of the Granville County Sheriff in May of 1754. Promptly, Chavis delivered copies of the South Carolina court order to two Orange County justices of the peace. Then he attended the Orange County court himself to present the hue and cry on Busby's behalf. Chavis claimed that the boy Busby was Amy Hall's son, John Scott. Another man with holdings in Granville and Orange counties 
gave evidence that convinced the court that Busby was indeed John Scott. And the court arranged for the boy to be taken home to Amy Hall. The racial identity of this witness is not known, but his wife was African-American, so he may well have been too. What I'm saying is that in the earliest years of Orange County, free people of African ancestry used the county court to rescue a person who had been kidnapped and transported as a slave. Now, I for one cannot imagine this taking place even 10 or 15 years later, because things changed. There's also a different path to finding information about free persons of African ancestry in <coughs> the context of the regulator movement. This is by using the names on petitions that were made against the so-called tax on Negroes. Free African-American men wrote and signed a number of petitions to the North Carolina Assembly and their names are there. Now, what this is about is back in 1723, the assembly reworded the law regarding the tax on slaves so that it became what they called a tax on Negroes, a very different matter. Under this law, all heads of household were to play, pay a set tax on every person in the household over the age of 12 who was either African, African European, or African Native American ancestry, or who had married someone of either description. Now, all men aged 16 to 60 already had to pay a poll tax. So the new feature of the tax on Negroes was its application to females over 12 years old and males be 12 between 12 and 16 years old. Their fathers and husbands paid a tax that husbands and fathers of their white counterparts did not have to pay. This was the same level of tax that the men would have had to pay if their wives and children had been slaves whom the fathers and husbands owned. So this is not a tax on slaves anymore, though there is a tax on slaves. This is a separate thing. It's a tax on Negroes, and that definition of Negroes is pretty broad. Of course, this was offensive, and it could be a financial burden, another tax to pay. Here is a little snippet from a 1672 petition from the back country, and I'm quoting, Many inhabitants of said counties are free Negroes and mulattoes and persons of probity and good demeanor and cheerfully contribute toward the discharge of every public duty enjoined them by law. But by reason of being obliged by the said act of assembly to pay levies for their wives and daughters, as they're in mention, are greatly impoverished. Now, like many records that old, this one is torn, but and so we don't know how many signatures it originally had, but there's, there are 55 signatures that still remain on the tor torn, torn document in the state archives. Now, even more interesting for relationship with the regulation is there is a similar petition that went to the assembly in 1771, near the time of the Battle of Alamance. One is struck by the time. The regulator movement raised the profile of petitioning. The subject's right to petition the king and be heard was a cherished practice, centuries old. The 1771 petition against the tax on Negroes shared some language with the regulator petitions, language that's not present in earlier petitions of this sort. The 1771 petition says, and I quote, your petitioners humbly conceive the tax is highly derogatory to the rights of freeborn citizens, 
end quote. So these men are claiming their rights as freeborn subjects. I said citizens, but actually it was the rights of, of freeborn subjects. And this petition bore 85, uh, um, 75, 75 names. Who were these 75 men? Their names offered a path to other records that did not always identify ethnicity. And so these other records would have been bypassed in a search for people of African ancestry. And with a little digging around, um, in fact, a lot of digging around, this, this approach proved fruitful, very much worth it. There is a subcommittee of the Alamance Battleground Friends who are preparing a dramatic presentation um, of presenting some of their words. Using some of these 75 names to find information about enough of these men made it possible to include a scene explaining the petition and some of the family histories that it brings in the, to focus. So that's been, that's been very gratifying. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing that with the public in the uh, not too distant future. And what I'm saying is that using the names on that petition was the gateway to getting into other records determining whether or not the person by the same the people by the same name really were the same people uh and and so forth so that's that's an easy a good thing to round out and the uh, as i close i will give you one last little tidbit about busby busby appears later um, during the revolutionary war he served in the 3rd South Carolina Regiment of the Continental Army. And the, the name he used there was not John Scott, but John Busby. And he was in a company with men who had the last name of Holly. So that worked out too. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much, Carol. It is a very exciting project that you're working on. Um, I'm going to give uh, a couple of uh, minutes here for folks. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about uh, what Carol has presented, um, please leave them in the chat box and um, we'll uh, give her a chance to, to answer them here. Uh, now's a great time. Um, and um, I guess uh, for Mark Pyre, I'm, I'm curious to, to know, Carol, um, when, you were, uh, when you were doing this research, especially on the 1771 petition, uh, what names that you saw uh, stuck out at you particularly? Uh, Petty Ford is one that stuck out. And uh, I could do... A I could, uh, Bass was there, Mitchell was there. Uh, oh my goodness, I'm just not gonna remember them now because my name has been in this, but I can look them up pretty quickly and, uh, and, and, and get back, um, you know. And let's see. Uh, while you are, um, while you're looking at that, I do have a question from Sandy Lewis can, uh, and this might actually be a, a question that Mark can help answer. Can you give info how to locate those transcribed Orange County tax records? Uh, no, it's the transcribed Orange County minute books. Um, yeah, that, that Mark has just come out with. And, um, you know, Mark, Mark is the source for saying if he's going to um, pu publish those, which I, I assume that he will, and, and make them available to buy. Um, Orange County tax records. 
I don't really have any transcriptions of those. I, I transcript my own, transcribe my own back when I was working on Shuttle and Plow. Um, and that involved reading a lot of uh, microfilm, which I have a microfilm reader right here by my side. Right there. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's the true mark of a professional right there. Well, I, I'm, I am incredibly I, jealous. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a professional or just someone who goes in for a lot of punishment. But <laughs> there, there still are a lot of things that <laughs> have not been transcribed, of course, and, and digitized. Of course, it's wonderful when people uh, not only transcribe things, but, um, but, but digitize them, too. And I look at things that, uh, not, not in this context, but in some other 18th century research that I do, I look at things that have been digitized and are online now that I had to borrow from interlibrary loan, three reels at a time, and then it was hard to read them because of the handwriting and the fading and transcribing. And I think, oh, these people today got it so easy. But you know, isn't that always what old people say? I think it's wonderful, of course, that so much is being digitized and, and put online. Yeah, yeah, okay. In, in defense of some of the old ways though, I, I do have to say sometimes we, we uh, can be sort of uh, complacent uh, in technology and what is easiest to access. And well, it's not in this oh, digital yeah. archive, so what can you do? Uh, but oh, there yeah. are still some, some older methods of, of getting some things that aren't online yet. So it's, it's good to, to have that well, in our, our toolbox, so to speak. Yeah, another thing is some of the transcriptions are not accurate. Um, mm -hmm. particularly with, um, with, with family names. And, you know, if, if you're researching in an, an area where you know a lot of family names and you see something that just looks like garbage and you go back to, to the microfilm and check it, then you see, oh, that's a very common name. Uh, the transcriber just was not familiar with it. And that used to be the case back in um, when census records were first being put on CDs. You're, if anybody's old enough to remember that, that was wonderful. I think Heritage Quest did the first ones. And oh, it was just so full of transcribing errors. It's practically useless. Now, the people who transcribe for ancestry uh, are much, much better. And the good thing about ancestry is, of course, you can go to the image and you can read the name yourself. If you know, if, if you think, well, that may, may be something else and you go back to do it. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good challenge that we're working back and forth between the old ways and, and the new ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, well, uh, the uh, esteemed Register of Deeds for Orange County has weighed in, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark says that uh, he'll be posting on our website sometime soon. Uh, please email me for copies, mchilton at outlook.com. So, for those of you who are interested, uh, you can get in touch with him at mchilton at outlook. Dot com. Uh, he also says that uh, he's finished uh, 1787 to 1814, and you're still working and, and doing an excellent job, Mark. Um, Saint Mark, that's who you. <laughs> Saint Mark. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. All right, general question uh, about recording. Um, will recordings be made available at some point in the future? And uh, apologies to Carol, we, we did miss the first couple minutes with the technical difficulty, but uh, oh. I'm recording right now. Um, we got the, the, uh, the bulk of your uh, video and we're gonna be posting that on the Alamance Battleground YouTube channel. Uh, and then we will be sharing that uh, through our Facebook page. So um, for those of you who uh, want to watch this online or are not able to, to hang out for the entire day, our other uh, speakers uh, will also have their uh, talks recorded. Um, uh, knock on wood for no more uh, technical issues and um, uh, they will be available later. Um, I'll give it one more minute here for questions from Carol. 
Oh, someone asked, uh, what are the kinds of records um, that you would dream of finding on this topic? Oh my goodness, um, <clears throat> letters, of course, and a, a lot of these uh, people of African ancestry were literate. Um, and in fact, that was less, that was more common than it became later. Um, and I remember um, it, there's, um, there's an account in some of the Moravian records where Moravian travelers, they were just over the line in Virginia and they, they stopped with a, um, an innkeeper and spent the night and the innkeeper was a black man and he, he knew Moravian uh, theology uh, in fact, he, he spoke German, evidently he'd been pretty close to the Moravians, and so he, of course, made them very welcome, and, um, and this, this man could, uh, could write, um, and, you know, was just, just normal, everyday backcountry settler who had a good, good business going, so we, we know that there were people at this time who 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 were literate and you know who knows what's going to turn up um in somebody's attic or or whatever history changes so much uh, it changes in part because um new records are found and it changes of course because uh every generation has new questions to ask and if you change the questions that you're asking of history you get different you get a different history absolutely i i am um I, i'm always surprised at what also is hiding in plain sight that um is in sources that have been looked over especially with the regulator movement that uh you know got looked at you know in some cases 50 years uh, or so ago um looking for just different things and, and stories mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. don't get uh, get written about uh, quite as much. I, I've I've mm -hmm. been spending more time talking about the um, the women who are uh, either uh, have their lives affected by the regulator movement, the Battle of Alamance, or who play a very uh, large role. And I don't remember reading about them that much in some of the older uh, history, but then they're, um, they're there in the primary sources and petitions from widows seeking support and um, uh, women who are just uh, sitting there in, um, you know, invoices uh, doing things for the militia and um, uh, acting as nurses after the battle. It's, it's references that, um, yeah. you know, there's, it's, and it's not new, but um, it's just going back over and saying, oh, you know, the, this is something that maybe didn't get the level of attention uh, that, that it needed, like back in the bicentennial era. Yeah. Now you ask about last names on those petitions. Um, Head, Childs, Hendricks, Roberts, Williamson, White, I think I already said Mitchell and Bass, Hudson, uh, Hedgepeth, Caudle, Hunt, Howard, Philpot, Langston. Uh, some of these are names that we know are still around. Uh, some of them uh, probably have, uh, have gone to uh, from from uh, westward migration. So yeah, there's uh, there's 55 names on one and 75 names on another, and and some of them you would associate with uh, with Eastern North Carolina. The, you know maybe these people originated in Eastern North Carolina and moved into here. Uh, a name like Alston, for example, uh, Anderson, Word. Curtis, McLean, Neville, Cheeves, or which is a, really the same name as Chavis, Fish, Brown, Strickland, Folsom, Richardson. Yeah, those are names. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Carol, for uh, bringing this slide. It's a very important perspective for us to be looking at uh, as, as the regulator movement, uh, the end of the regulator movement turns 250 years old. So thank you uh, so much for being with us today. Sure. All right.
Uh, so we are going to take a little break and uh, we will be back for our next speaker, uh, Mark Chilton, uh, at uh, 11.15. So we're going to take a little break. Sherry has uh, her, um, uh, is it the slideshow that you're going to run as sort of a screensaver? We are going to save a uh, screensaver here in just a second. Here we go. Um, we will be back and when we come back, we will be announcing our door prize winners. Um, thank you for telling us how many people are watching. We will be asking you again at the second hour, but I can tell you that over a hundred people are watching and we are so grateful for your attendance. And we look forward to spending some time with you in, at 11.15. So take a break, grab some coffee and we'll see you in just a few minutes. Thanks everyone.